Uh, so we're thinking about Jesus now. Um, one of the things that I love about Facebook is uh, getting in touch with uh, old friends that I haven't uh, heard from for years. However, what usually happens after the initial contact, contact and the questions back and forth uh, to find out uh, what uh, each other's been doing is that the relationship sort of just settles back into the dormant state that it was in the intervening years. Uh, finding out what an old school friend is doing uh, really often does nothing more than satisfy my curiosity. Uh, it doesn't have any real impact on our friendship. How important is it for us to think about Jesus now? Uh, is it just something to merely satisfy our curiosity? A after all, surely it's more important to think about what Jesus did in the past, uh, to think about his incarnation, his life, his death, his resurrection, uh, or to think about Jesus in the future, uh, his return, uh, his reign. Well, my hope this evening is that we'll see that thinking about Jesus now is important, uh, not just in helping us to understand some of the New Testament's key <coughs> teaching, but also in helping us to live as Christians in the world. Our faith as Christians is in Jesus, uh, the Jesus who died and rose again, and the Jesus who will one day come again, but also the Jesus who is currently sitting at God's right hand. Uh, so Paul in uh, Colossians 3 verse 1 tells the Colossians to <clears throat> excuse me, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Hebrews 3.1 tells the readers to fix their thoughts on Jesus. Uh, Paul in 1 Thessalonians describes Christians as those who are waiting for God's Son from heaven. Uh, so as Christians, our gaze is to be directed uh, to the risen Lord Jesus. So what I want us to do is to think about who Jesus is now, where he is, and what he is doing. So who is Jesus now? I imagine that if you ask many Christians, is Jesus a human being today? Um, many would hesitate, and some, at least in my experience, would say no. Uh, because it's easy to think of Jesus becoming a human being simply to be able to die, uh, but once he's died and, and risen again, well, is there any need for him to remain a human being? And so people can easily think that somewhere along the way, perhaps after rising from the dead, perhaps ascending to, to heaven, Jesus somehow sheds his humanity. But the New Testament won't let us think like that. And it draws important principles from Jesus' ongoing humanity. Uh, so the New Testament is clear that the risen Lord Jesus is both God and man. Now, I will think about uh, Jesus uh, being truly God uh, briefly, and then we'll spend more time on him being a human being. So the risen Lord, the risen Lord Jesus is truly God. I, I imagine for most of us uh, as Christian believers, we believe that Jesus is risen and exalted. Uh, we won't have any problem with the idea that Jesus remains uh, God. There are many places we could go in the New Testament to see this, um, particularly John's Gospel, if you do have kind of, uh, struggles over the, the deity of Jesus. John's gospel is really the place to go. John opens his gospel by stating, in the beginning was the word, that's his description of Jesus, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, the word uh, is with God, he's in relationship with God, but more than that, he actually is God. Uh, but Jesus' deity obviously continues beyond his time on earth. Uh, in chapter 17 of John's gospel, uh, Jesus prays to his father, just hours before his um, arrest and crucifixion. And early on in his prayer, he prays, uh, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Uh, the Son was always God. There was never a time when he was not the true God. But when he was on earth, his glory was concealed. Uh, people didn't see his glory as the Son of God. Uh, but uh, this prayer is answered when Jesus rises from the dead, ascends into heaven, and uh, the glory that he had before the incarnation is restored. And he is seen for who he really is, uh, the Son of God. Jesus never stopped being God. Uh, he was still God when he was born as a man. He was God when he uh, rose from the dead. He was, he's God in heaven today. Uh, the Jesus whom we fix our eyes on, in whom we trust, is truly God.
Now, as I say, I imagine most of us don't have that much problem with that, but we can also say, we can also say the risen Lord Jesus is truly man. He is truly a human being. As I said, the assumption that sometimes people make is that, you know, when Jesus had done the work of our redemption, well, there was no need for him to continue to be a human being. And so somewhere along the way, he shed his humanity as if the resurrection or the, in, or the ascension sort of reverses the incarnation. Uh, but the New Testament won't let us think like that. And um, we're just going to take a bit of a whistle-stop tour uh, through what the New Testament says about Jesus after his uh, resurrection. And we'll see that each point, the New Testament affirms that Jesus remains a human being with a physical human body. Okay, so we're going to move quite quickly, um, and then we're going to draw some implications on this aspect of Jesus now. So firstly, Jesus rose as a human being with a physical body. Uh, Luke 24, uh, you know, e each of the Gospels gives us the, the, the post-resurrection account. Uh, in Luke 24, we have Jesus speaking with his disciples after the resurrection. And the disciples' initial reaction is to think that they've seen a ghost. But Jesus, Jesus uh, reassures them, uh, verse 39, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit or a ghost uh, does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Uh, the risen Lord Jesus is a human being with a physical body that could be touched and he could also eat. So verse 41, while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Now, Jesus rose as a genuine human being with a physical body. He could be touched and he could eat. And, you know, it's not in the text, but I, I like to think of the idea that even after Jesus left them, the fish bones uh, would have sat there as testimony to his bodily resurrection, to his ongoing humanity. Now, probably in the medieval ages, you could have bought those fish bones, um, <laughs> but um, uh, they, they testified to his ongoing humanity. Secondly, Jesus ascended into heaven as a human being with a physical body. Uh, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he did not shed his humanity on the way. So uh, Acts 1, chapter 9 describes Jesus ascending to heaven in front of his disciples. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. The disciples see Jesus ascend into heaven as a human being with a human body. It's not as if he sort of dissolves before them. They see him rise up. My kid's picture Bible gets this right. Uh, you really see Jesus rising in human bodily form. Uh, thirdly, Jesus reigns in heaven as a human being with a physical body. And we'll spend a little bit uh, more time on this. So you might want to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 on your phone or uh, your Bible. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul is affirming, defending, proving the truth of the resurrection. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of Christians. And it seems that the Corinthians were confused about the resurrection. Corinthians were confused about a lot of things, but it seems that they were confused about the resurrection. And it seems as if uh, they had a problem with the idea of uh, a resurrection for uh, people other than Jesus. They sort of were clear on Jesus' resurrection. But Paul's showing that you can't, um, you, you can't disconnect the two. And so verse 20, uh, he is very clear that Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Christ has been risen and others will follow. He is the first fruits. But two things to note from this very important passage. First, Paul makes a very clear comparison between Adam and Christ, <coughs> excuse me, uh, between Adam and Christ that turns on them both being human beings. So verse 21, as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay, the comparison is between two human beings, if you like, Adam and the second Adam, Christ. 
But secondly, uh, Paul tells us that Jesus must reign until he has put all things under his feet. Uh, verse 25, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Uh, the last enemy to be destroyed is death, uh, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, it's important that we grasp what Paul is doing here. Uh, verse 27, he's actually referring to the Old Testament. So Paul is proving that Christ must reign in this way, and the way that he proves it is by appealing to the Old Testament scriptures. Now, there were no quotation marks in, in Paul's day, uh, but he's effectively saying Jesus must reign until he defeats all his enemies, and that includes death. And the reason that we know that is because verse 27 the Old Testament says God has put all things in subjection under his feet. That's why we know that uh, we will be raised from the dead. Because if we weren't raised, well, then Jesus wouldn't have defeated death. Uh, death would still uh, be reigning. So Paul is quoting a part of the Old Testament that shows us that God has put all things in subjection under Jesus. And this will only be fulfilled when Jesus defeats all his enemies. Now, crucially, the part of the Old Testament that Paul is quoting here is Psalm 8. Okay, so Psalm 8, verse 6, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. Uh, but what is Psalm 8 uh, about? Uh, if you know Psalm 8, you know that it is David's great celebration of humanity. Uh, so David asks in verse 4, what is man that you are mindful of him? the son of man that you care for him. You've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. And then here's the bit that Paul quotes. You have put all things under his feet. Uh, what is man that you're mindful, about, uh, uh, mindful of him? David in Psalm 8 is speaking about humanity, about mankind. In other words, God's purpose for uh, humanity is that uh, human beings rule everything under God. And so when Paul applies this psalm to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15, he's applying it to Jesus as man. That Jesus is the true man. Jesus is the man who fulfills Psalm 8. And so if when he ascended into heaven, Jesus somehow stopped being a human being, well, he couldn't fulfill this psalm. He couldn't fulfill God's charter for humanity. Now, if you're into sports, uh, you'll know that uh, some of the cruelest moments come when someone is disqualified. Um, I'm sorry if this is too close to the bone as an Australian audience, but you might remember uh, Jane Savile, uh, the uh, Australian race walker, <clears throat> as she was leading the, the 20 kilometer race walk, and she entered the Olympic Stadium and was set to win another gold for the host nation. Then an official stepped out holding a red card to tell her that she had been disqualified for apparently having two feet off the ground at one point in the race. Saville broke down and began screaming, no, 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 not me. She broke the rules and had to be disqualified. Okay, that's, well, not, not for Jane Saville, but it's, it's a relatively trivial uh, illustration, <laughs> but uh, if... If Jesus was no longer a human being, well, there's a sense in which he too would be disqualified. He wouldn't be able to fulfill Psalm 8. He wouldn't be able to fulfill God's plan, God's charter for humanity. But Jesus does remain a man. He is currently remaining, uh, reigning as a man, and he will do so until all his enemies are put under his feet. And that means the defeat of death for everybody, resurrection. But even then, he doesn't stop being a human being. Two more aspects to look at. Uh, Jesus will return from heaven as a human being with a physical body. Now, it's at this point that really gets to the heart of why it's important for us that Jesus remains a human being. Now, the fact that Jesus remains a, a man will have an eternal impact on us. Because when we are raised from the dead, we will be like him. That means we will be glorified human beings like he is a glorified human being. Now, Paul fleshes this out in uh, Philippians 3 uh, when he says, uh, verse 20, our citizenship as Christians, our citizenship is in heaven. 
And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Our bodies will be like his body. Jesus will transform our humanity. Uh, he will glorify it. Uh, when Jesus became a man, he was subject to all the limitations that we face uh, living in a fallen world, uh, except he was without sin, but he was subject to tiredness, to sadness, to weakness, even to death. When he was raised, he was raised into glory, but critically, he still remained a human being a glorified human being, but a human being nonetheless. And when he returns, we will follow the same path. He will transform our bodies into the likeness of his glorious body. One says that sort of develops the idea of what, uh, what Paul had already said in 1 Corinthians 15. We will be, uh, now we bear the image of Adam with all that that entails, then we will bear the image of Christ with all that that wonderfully uh, entails. Jesus will bring humanity into glory. Uh, Jesus secures a perfect future for us because we'll be like him. He will change our bodies, uh, weak uh, as they are, so that they will be like his glorified body. But that's not the end of the story because Jesus will reign forever as a human being with a physical body. Uh, Jesus' ongoing humanity is not simply for our sakes, it's for his glory. So uh, Romans 8.28, I imagine, is a familiar verse uh, to you. Uh, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And sometimes, you know, the Christian calendar will end the quote uh, there, but it does continue, for those who are called according to his purpose. And then you think, well, what, what is his purpose? Well, Paul tells us in verse 29, here is his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. And this is the idea that we've been thinking about. We will be conformed to the image of Jesus. We will be like him. But it's what comes next that's vital. In order that Jesus might be firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Firstborn essentially means supreme. Christ will be supreme among many brothers and sisters. So the wonderful picture of eternity is Jesus as supreme, surrounded by men and women who are like him. So the glory is reflected back to him. God's purpose uh, that we have been called to, God's amazing plan, is that there will be a human being at the center of the universe for all eternity. There will be a human being at the center of the universe for all eternity. And we will be like him. And because we are like him, <laughs> the glory will go to him, will be reflected to him. So we've seen at each point, uh, from the incarnation onwards into all eternity, Jesus remains a human being with a physical body. When Jesus became a human being, he became a human being forever, and he will retain a physical body forever. Now, there are many different ways this truth about Jesus should impact our thinking and our Christian lives, but there are two which I think are particularly important. Uh, first of all, uh, particularly as evangelicals, we are rightly concerned to stress the deity of Christ. It is, after all, what makes Jesus unique. Here is the only man who was and is also God. There is and was no one like him. However, in stressing the deity of Christ, we can easily forget or downplay his humanity. It's important that we remember his humanity because it shows us that human life is extremely valuable in God's eyes. When God became a man, he did so for eternity, not just for 30 years, not just for 2,000 years, but for eternity. Uh, increasingly, though, Western society is becoming intolerant of the idea that humanity is unique. So as far back as 1973, 
a British psychologist, Richard D. Ryder, coined the term speciesism to note a prejudice against non-humans. He used the term to describe what he, what he saw as discrimination that is pr practiced by human beings against other species and argued that speciesism was as bad as racism. Now, as our society turns its back on its Christian heritage, surely this kind of thinking uh, will increase. In fact, certain forms of um, ecological animal rights thinking, certain forms, uh, already portray this distorted view of the place of humanity. Uh, you also see it play out in some of the pro-abortion and euthanasia arguments. In contrast, the risen, exalted Jesus, truly God, and truly human, shows God's eternal commitment to humanity. And that means that we are to treat all human beings with respect and dignity, the unborn, the weak, the poor, the terminally ill. All humanity is valuable in the eyes of God and of greater value than any other species. As Christians, uh, I guess we, we tend to go to the, the doctrine of creation to understand the place of humanity. That's right and helpful, but we also need to remember the fact of Jesus' eternal incarnation. Uh, we live in a fallen world and it's easy to look around and it seems as if there's nothing uh, very noble about humanity. In many ways, uh, we're often no better than the brute beasts. Uh, but Jesus shows us that humanity will not always be like this. Jesus shows us what humanity is meant to be. And Jesus shows us what humanity will one day be. Human beings are special in God's eyes, and we know that because the Son of God became a man and remains a man forever. Uh, secondly, uh, Jesus retains a human body, and so, uh, as Christian believers, we will be like him. And that means that, like him, we will retain our bodies for eternity. We will be transformed, we will be different, uh, but we will still retain our bodies. Our eternal future will be a physical, bodily future. Uh, sometimes uh, Christians can unintentionally pit the physical against the spiritual, as if the spiritual was somehow more holy than the physical. And so people can talk about redemption in terms of escaping from uh, the body. And the problem with that is then the spiritual can seem vague. It can seem less real than our uh, current physical earthly existence. And so it becomes less attractive. Uh, so images of eternity involving kind of floating around on clouds, playing harps. Um, and, you know, I think even if you're a harp enthusiast, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not all that appealing. And uh, it's, it's part of the reason, if we're honest, for many of us, that in our heart of hearts, we're not sure we really want to go to heaven, at least not yet, because there's so much that we want to get out of life uh, at the moment. Um, you know, the acronym YOLO, you only live once, expresses that desire. We've, we've got to make the most uh, of life. We have so much more that we want to experience here because eternity just feels kind of ethereal compared to our existence on earth. And yet, in, in reality, our bodies, our physical existence, our humanity will actually be more real than now, in, in a sense. And I was picked up once by a philosopher for that. Uh, for saying that, but you know what I mean. It will feel uh, more real uh, than now. We're looking forward to the day when our, our bodies will be redeemed, when they'll be transformed and glorified, improved, if you like, not when they'll be dissolved and disappear. We're looking forward to a future uh, that is more real, that is more of what it means to be human, because Jesus has gone before us, and he didn't dissolve into spiritual nothingness. He retains his humanity. He retains his body. And as we think more about Jesus as he is now, we get a clearer view of reality. That eternity is more real, more glorious, more substantial, more human, if you like, than life now. And so it is something that we can long for. And we're not missing out. It's not ethereal. It's not inconsequential. It is, in a sense, more substantial. It is uh, more of what it means to really be 
a human being. Who is Jesus now? He is truly God and truly man. And one day we will be like him and we will be truly human. And we can look forward to that transformation and we can look forward to that eternal bodily substantial existence. But secondly, uh, where is Jesus now? Uh, it's the sort of question you can imagine the seven-year-old asking her Sunday school teacher, where is Jesus now? And in one sense, this is a very easy question to answer because the New Testament is crystal clear that Jesus is now in heaven at God's right hand. In Acts 1.9, as we said, uh, the disciples see Jesus ascend into heaven. Hebrews 8.1 the author specifically tells us that we have a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 describes believers as those who wait for Jesus to come from heaven. And in fact, in a sermon in Acts chapter 3, Peter tells the crowd that Jesus must remain in heaven until God restores all things. So the New Testament is crystal clear. Jesus is in heaven. That's not all the New Testament says. Uh, Paul, who's very clear that Jesus is in heaven, can also say in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Similarly, in Ephesians 3.17, Paul prays that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And in Romans 8.10, he tells the Roman uh, Christians that Christ is in you. Likewise, before he ascends into heaven, at the end of Matthew's gospel, what does Matthew tell the disciples? Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So the New Testament is crystal clear. Jesus is in us and with us. Jesus is in heaven, but he's also with us. He's at God's right hand, but he's also in our hearts. How do we resolve this seeming tension? Well, one possibility is that we might say, well, Jesus is God, God is everywhere, and so then we'd expect Jesus to be in heaven and in our hearts. There's no tension or problem at all. Now, the only problem with that answer is the New Testament doesn't just locate Jesus in heaven, but it, it teaches that Jesus is in heaven, and because he is there, he is absent from us. Jesus is absent from us. So Philippians 1.23, Paul describes his great desire to depart, to die, and be with Christ, which is far better. Uh, later in 3.20, as he said, we, we wait, we're waiting, we're longing for Christ to come from heaven. At 2 Corinthians 5 verse 6, Paul states that if we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. In other words, for Paul, there's a sense in which Jesus is not here with us. If Jesus was here with us in, in the fullest sense, well then why would he want to die to go and be with Jesus? That, that longing wouldn't make any sense. But, but if, if Jesus is in us, how can we be away from him? So it seems that it, uh, we have this tension between what we might call the absence and presence of Christ. Christ is absent in the sense that we're away from him, and we wait for him to come from heaven, Christ is present in the sense that he's in us and with us. So how do we hold uh, this seeming tension between the absence and presence of Christ? Well, there are a few passages we could go to answer this question, but I think um, there's one that, that might not be that obvious, but I think is, is quite helpful, and that's 1 Corinthians 5. And in this chapter, Paul is appalled at the behavior of the Corinthians. Uh, because they're not only uh, tolerating uh, the behavior of a man in their congregation uh, who is sinning gravely, uh, but they simultaneously have a very high view of their own spiritual status. Uh, Paul is not going to sit back and let this continue. Okay? He's not going to let them continue to tolerate uh, this man who is uh, engaging in such serious sin. The problem, however, is that he writes his letter from Ephesus, which is about uh, one, one and a half uh, thousand kilometers from Corinth. So what, what can he do from there? Well, his absence is not going to prevent him from acting. And this is what he says uh, in verse 3. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as present, 
I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. So Paul understands himself to be absent in body, but present in spirit. And so he expects the Corinthians to act in light of his presence. Uh, when you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Though bodily located many miles away, Paul's spirit is with the Corinthians. He is absent in body and present in spirit. Now, in some ways, and we've got to be careful, we can use this distinction to think about Jesus. Jesus is absent because he has a body. Uh, the reason that Jesus is separated from us is that, as we've said, as well as being God, Jesus remains a human being. He's a human being with a body, uh, even an exalted one, which means that like any other human being, his location is fixed. He is not everywhere. Okay, and uh, we've said that that comes out in uh, Philippians 3.20. Uh, when we wait, uh, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. So there Paul expresses Jesus' absence in bodily terms. We're, we're waiting for his body, if you like. It's his body that makes him absent. So his absence is a bodily absence. Uh, in terms of the specific location of Jesus, I don't think we can say anything more than he has a body and that he is in heaven. And there's no point in trying to pinpoint where exactly Jesus is. Paul simply says uh, in Ephesians 4 verse 10 uh, that when Jesus ascends into heaven, he is exalted far above all the heavens. Okay, so the, the idea of the absence of Christ, Christ stresses the fact that he is not with us because he has a, hum, uh, a, a body, human body, and is somewhere else beyond the realms of the universe. And so I don't think we need to think of Christ uh, as a human being, being in heaven as somehow contradicting modern cosmology. Uh, this doctrine places Christ beyond the realms of our universe. Uh, modern science has sought to describe the inner structure of the universe itself. It, it doesn't really say anything meaningful about existence beyond the, the created universe or the multiverse, if you prefer. And so I don't think it stands in this tension with the idea of Christ uh, being uh, with God in, in heaven. Um, so he's absent because he has a human being and he is located somewhere else. But he is present through the Spirit. Uh, what exactly do we mean when we say that Jesus is present in or through the Spirit? Uh, it's, it's one of those phrases that you can easily uh, rattle off without really kind of thinking exactly what it means. And Romans 8 uh, is uh, helpful for us to think about this. And uh, Romans 8 uh, verse 9, he reassures the Roman Christians that you, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in, dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Do you notice how Paul switches between the spirit and Christ? Uh, verse 10, if Christ is in you. Uh, verse 11, it's the spirit who dwells in you. Okay, so he switches between the Spirit being in them and Christ being in them. And you get a similar thought in uh, John 14, you might remember, when Jesus teaches that on his departure, he will send the Spirit to them, but immediately he interprets that as he himself will come to them. So the Spirit coming to them, in a sense, means that Jesus himself will come to them. Okay, so Jesus can do that that can switch between the Spirit and himself in John 14, Paul can switch in the same way in Romans 8. What that means is the Spirit is not just a representative or substitute for the absent Jesus. He's not simply an ambassador. So when an Amer American ambassador is present, uh, we say that he comes representing the President of the United States. But we don't think of the President himself as actually being present. But it's different with God. Where the Spirit is, there is the Father and the Son. The Spirit is not the Son, uh, but he does more than just represent Jesus. 
Because of the nature of their relationship, he actually brings Jesus with him. It's very difficult for us to understand this because this is not the way that human relationships work. But in a sense, however, it shouldn't surprise us that God is beyond our understanding. Because of the work of the Spirit, that Jesus is really with us. If you are a Christian, he is really in you. So let's think about some implications. This is important for a number of reasons. Remembering that Christ is in us by the Spirit means that our gaze should be upward and forward, not simply inward. Because the Spirit in us points us to the Christ who is currently absent in heaven, but will one day return. Ironically, the presence of Christ in us by the Spirit reminds us that we are absent from Christ. And that's why the heart cry of the Christian should be with Paul. We desire to depart and be with Christ. That is far better. While we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. The spiritual person is the person who's focused on the coming Christ, not on themselves. Uh, Secondly, the presence of Jesus by the Spirit helps us to think of the role of the churches in the world. Uh, You might have heard uh, heard this poem. Christ has no hands but our hands to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in his way. He has no tongue but our tongue to tell men how he died. He has no help but our help to bring them to his side. Uh, Now, there may be an element, a very small element of truth in that poem, um, but that is always the way with heresy. Uh, There's always a little bit of truth that makes it attractive. (coughs) That Jesus is bodily absent. However, the church, and churches are not the presence of Christ in the world. The spirit is. We need to remember that the church is under Jesus. He is our Lord. He is our head. We are dependent on him. He is not dependent on us. He rules us through his word by his spirit. Uh, Paul, at the end of 2 Corinthians, can say, Christ is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. Yes, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Uh, Christ is is powerful, not passive. Yes, he's absent in body, but through through the Spirit, he is present and he is powerful amongst us. We are dependent on him. He is not dependent on us. But also remembering that Jesus is present to us by the Spirit should be a great encouragement to us. Uh, Yes, we long uh, with the Apostle Paul for the full bodily presence of Christ when he returns or when we go to be with him. Uh, But even as we do, we are not left as orphans because he really is with us through the Spirit. It's not like being separated from a relative on the other side of the world. Jesus' promise to the disciples uh, still stands. He will never leave us or forsake us. He is in us. He is with us. And we're not alone. I I don't know if you've ever had the experience. I I certainly have. Where You you can read the Gospels and you think, I wish I was there. I I wish I could have seen Jesus like the disciples saw him. I I wish I could have heard him preach. I wish I could have seen him perform miracles. But actually, as a Christian today, you're in a better position than the disciples then. If you're a believer in Jesus, you have the Spirit of Christ in you. And it's the Spirit who enables you to grasp who Jesus is. When you read the Gospels, you see that time and time again, the disciples just couldn't grasp who Jesus was. It was only as the Spirit was given could they understand his identity. And so it is with us. Because we have the Spirit of Christ, we have the Spirit who makes Christ present to us. And so we can grasp who Jesus is. We can recognize that he is Lord of all. We can recognize that he is not here, but one day he will return and we will be with him forever. Uh, Thirdly, let's think about what is Jesus doing now? Now, there's lots we could say, lots we could uh, look at, but I just want us to focus on three aspects. And in fact, I might skip over uh, one of them. Uh, Firstly, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of his father. Now, it might appear that sitting It's not all that significant an activity. Uh, I don't know if you've seen many movies where the hero sits down the whole way through the the, the movie. Uh, Hollywood's heroes are active and busy and doing things. But I think one of the most important aspects to grasp about Jesus' current activity is that he is sitting. 
And the fact that Jesus is sitting means that his work of redemption is finished. He, he's won the battle. He's won our redemption. He doesn't need to continue uh, to be active. Uh, so we're going to spend a little bit of time in Hebrews. So you might want to ch- uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. We're actually going to work backwards uh, through Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, the author talks about how under the Old Testament sacrificial system, sins were not uh, really dealt with. Uh, the fact that, that uh, the priests continued to be busy year after year, sacrificing again and again, pointed to the fact that their sacrifices didn't work. The reason, simply, uh, verse 4, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Then the author uh, moves to compare uh, these Old Testament priests to to Jesus. So uh, Hebrews will describe Jesus as a priest, but unlike these Old Testament priests who continue to offer sacrifices year after year, uh, verse 12, Jesus offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, and then he sat down. Why? Because his work is finished. Because, verse 14, by a single offering, he is perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. Only one sacrifice was necessary because the sacrifice that Jesus offered was his own perfect blood and it perfected the recipients for all time. He did not and does not need to do anything else to secure our redemption. And so he sat down. Hebrews 10, 14, it's very strong language. Because of Jesus' one sacrifice, we have been perfected for all time. But don't I still sin? Uh, Don't I need to change? Yes. But in God's sight, because of Jesus' one sacrifice, you are complete, perfect, not lacking anything in God's sight. In terms of your relationship with him, you are perfect. There is nothing that needs to be done to reconcile you to God. Nothing more that needs to be done to pay for your sin. Nothing more that needs to be done to deal with his wrath. As Christians, we need to continually remind ourselves of the cross, but we also need to remind ourselves of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, because it's that which reminds us that his death on the cross was effective and that we're now perfect in God's sight. Uh, Secondly, Jesus is appearing in heaven on our behalf. Um, Now, I probably don't have time to go through this, but... um, Let me tell you what I would have said if I did have time, which is uh, Jesus appearing in heaven on our behalf is his his very presence in heaven speaks to God on our behalf. So Hebrews 9, uh, verse 24, Jesus has entered heaven now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Verse 26, uh, as it is, he has appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Um, Chase on the reference uh, later, 1 John 2 uh, makes this uh, very clear. In describing Jesus as an advocate, okay, it's similar, a similar language, appearing in heaven on our behalf, Jesus is an advocate. The, the thing is, when you think of an advocate, you think lawyer, you think courtroom, you think someone who's speaking to the judge for us. But, but John uh, says Jesus is an advocate because he is the propitiation for our sins. So it's his past work on the cross that speaks to God for us, okay? It's what he did in the past, his sacrifice, that uh, speaks to God for us. So he is appearing in heaven on our behalf. His very presence in heaven speaks to God for us. But thirdly, and I just want to spend a little bit of time on this, Jesus is interceding at the right hand of his Father. So if we go back to Hebrews 7, Uh, The author, once again, is comparing Jesus to the Old Testament priests. And uh, this time, the the point of comparison is not so much the um, effectiveness of their sacrifice. Uh, This time, it is the fact that uh, the Old Testament priests died. Uh, Their individual priesthoods came to an end as each of them died. Whereas Jesus lives forever. And so his priesthood continues forever. And so the author tells us, verse 25, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Now, uh, verse 25 can jar a little, because haven't we just said that we're perfected already? 
So why does the author speak about us needing to be saved to the uttermost? If Jesus' work on the cross perfected us, why do we need to be saved to the uttermost? And how does this ongoing work of intercession fit with the idea that Jesus has finished his work and is sitting at God's right hand? Let's just think about this idea that we are, aren't we saved already? Uh, when I was a young Christian, I was a part of a, a church back in Northern Ireland, and each Christmas, uh, one of the older men in the church would play Santa Claus at the Sunday school Christmas party. And uh, he was a very godly man, and he was concerned uh, for the spiritual state of the children. So when they were put on his lap, he wouldn't ask them what they wanted for Christmas. No, he would ask them if they were saved. Now, I always wondered if someone actually became a Christian through this man and whether in their testimony they could share about being led to the Lord by Santa Claus. And I imagine there'd need to be, you know, some careful theological sorting out of what actually happens. But the point is, it's a legitimate question to ask someone because the New Testament can talk about us being saved already, Ephesians 2, 8, by grace. We have been saved through faith. But the New Testament can also speak about salvation as a future occurrence, something that still needs to happen. And in fact, uh, Hebrews 9, 28, the author says, Christ will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. Hebrews, this book that says so much about Jesus' one sacrifice for sin, about how he has finished his work, also says that salvation is future. If you read through Hebrews, you'll see the author writes an awful lot about the need to persevere and not to give up on the Christian life. In fact, in chapter 13, uh, the author describes his book as a word of exhortation. Uh, the whole of Hebrews, the whole book is written to exhort us not to give up, to keep going so that we'll be saved at the end. And the very severe warnings in Hebrews about the danger of giving up the Christian life. Doesn't that contradict what we've been saying already about how Jesus' death made us perfect in God's sight? No, because the Christian life is one of continual trust in Jesus. We don't just trust him once and then that's it. No, the Christian life is a life of continued trust in Jesus. And that's why it's so difficult because we continually face temptations to give up. I have two uh, very close friends who have given up the Christian life. One, because he fell in love with getting rich. The other, because he felt he couldn't live the Christian life. Now, they're giving up the Christian life, I think, shows they actually never really were Christians, but that's another discussion for another time. But whatever the reason, for all of us, uh, sooner or later, we will f uh, face the temptation uh, to give up. And the letter of Hebrews is written to those who are tempted to give up. We need to persevere as Christians, but persevering as Christians... It's not simply up to us. It's not simply a matter of our own effort, our own willpower. Now, the description of Jesus in 725 is so important. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is praying for us to be saved to the uttermost. Jesus is interceding for us to persevere. He's praying for us to keep going as Christians. Um, the intercession of Jesus is spoken about here. It's spoken about in Romans 8 as well. Uh, Jesus is described as interceding for us in Romans 8, as is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is described as interceding for us with groanings too deep for words. The Spirit is actively praying for us. Jesus is actively praying for us. It's not interceding for us to be reconciled to God. It's not as if every time we sin, Jesus speaks to the Father on our behalf. That's not what it's saying at all, because his work, of, uh, his, his work on the cross, his one sacrifice for all, has secured our relationship with God. But he's interceding for us. He's praying for us that we would be saved to the end, that we would keep going as Christians. He's praying for us to persevere. And that means that Jesus is praying in heaven the same way that he prayed on earth. Uh, Jesus uh, frequently prayed for his disciples to persevere. In Luke 22, he prays for Peter's faith not to fail. In John 17, he prays the disciples might be protected from the evil one. The prayers of Jesus then are for the perseverance in faith of the disciples. 
It's his ongoing prayer that sustained them in faith. What we are continually in need of is help to persevere. A temptation to give up the Christian life is so serious. The need to persevere in faith is stressed so strongly in Hebrews and the rest of the New Testament. But our perseverance does not depend on us. Jesus is praying for us, praying that we not fall in the face of temptation, praying that we would not give up, praying that we would persevere. So often we think of our perseverance in terms of things that we need to do, our praying, our Bible reading, our church attendance. But Hebrews reminds us, it does exhort us to keep going. It tells us don't give up meeting together. But it also reminds us that our perseverance ultimately rests on Christ. He prays. He intercedes for us to persevere, to keep going. It's a real encouragement to have a Christian friend praying for us. How much more to have Jesus praying for us at God's right hand. And the response is is not to sit back and go into cruise control. No, the response is to keep trusting in him, to keep, as uh, chapter 7, verse 25 says, to keep drawing near to God through him. Knowing that not only is he the only one who can reconcile us to God, but that he is the only one who can ensure that we make it to the end. What is Jesus doing now? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. His work of redemption is complete. Uh, Nothing more needs to be done by him or by us. It is finished. But he's also praying for us because we're not in heaven yet. When we sin, we need to remember that Jesus is sitting down, that his work is finished. When we struggle to keep going, when we're tempted to give up, we need to remember that Jesus is praying for us, praying that we will be saved to the uttermost. Jesus now, Jesus is a human being with a glorified body. He shows us humanity is precious. Uh, He reminds us of what one day lies ahead for us. Where is Jesus? Well, he's absent because he has a human body but he is present through the Spirit. And so even as we long to be reunited with him, we can be encouraged that he is with us. What is Jesus doing? He is sitting, his work of redemption is done, but he is praying for us that we would be saved to the uttermost. I think thinking about Jesus does much more than simply satisfy our curiosity. I'm going to repeat each question just for the sake of, uh, of the video and so on, and also to give Peter time to think. It's always handy to give, you know, repeat a question. The question is, um, to say that Jesus has a body now, and several times you mentioned a physical body. You used the words physical body. Does he have organs? Does he have eyes? Does he have kidneys? Does he have, um, you know, a nervous system? What's, uh, how, we th- how, to, uh, how are we to think about that? Uh, That's a very good question. Uh, The Bible doesn't answer it directly. Let me go to one place that might help us, and that's 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Um, And uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 35, uh, Paul says, Someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? And it's obvious in that context that question was sort of asked to trip Paul up because he immediately says, you foolish person. <laughs> and then he goes on to talk about the, the difference between um, our bodies now and our bodies then. So I did stress the continuity, that it is a body, that it's it's bonded in a sense. It is, it is physical, it can be touched, you could eat. But Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, does distinguish our body now from our glorified body. And uh, you know, he says there are different types of glory, and then he says, you know, it is sown perishable, it is raised imperishable, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It's sown a, a natural body, it is raised a, a body fit for the spiritual dimension. So there is there is difference. So I don't know is the <laughs> is the short answer uh, from that long uh, description, but I, I think one Corinthians fifteen helps us to to, to begin to to think about that. So the question is. If Jesus is praying to the Father in heaven on our behalf, interceding, and yet is is one with the Father, perhaps even more one with the Father now when he, than when he was on earth and one with the Father, how, how does that work? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the place that helps us there is, is Romans 8, where we see not just 
Jesus interceding with us, Romans 8.34, but the Spirit interceding with us, Romans 8.26. So this, that, that Jesus interceding with us is not, uh, I don't think, just a function simply of his, of the incarnation. It's not like because he's an incarnate human being, he relates to the Father through this prayer, because the Spirit, the Spirit prays to the Father. So it's, it's something about their relationship, uh, the, the order uh, within, within the Trinity, that the, the Son and the Spirit will both uh, pray, make requests, if you like, to, to the Father. It's an expression of, of their relationship, which shows us, I think, that that order within the Trinity is not simply uh, something that kind of came into being with the Incarnation, but it's, it's something of the, the nature of the relationship within, um, within the Trinity. Uh, you were picked up in an early occasion about talking about the reality, about what's really real and whether Jesus' existence now is even more real, as it were, than when he was on earth. Can you expand? Yeah, uh, I'm not a, a philosopher or the son of a philosopher, but uh, <laughs> I believe that the, the sort of use of the word real is, is something that has kind of specific philosophical purchase. And by saying that kind of the new creation is more real than this creation, they were saying I was making a, a sort of ontological distinction that, that, that isn't really there. W I meant the word in a much sort of more popular sense that I think our problem when we think about eternity is it just feels ethereal. You know, it, it just doesn't seem attractive because we can't conceptualize it. It, it just it seems vague and ill-defined. And that's why this world is so it has such a pull on us because not not just the you know the sinful pull but the the pull of of relationships and and good food for which we're thankful for and holidays and and those experiences seem much more tangible and real than an ethereal eternity of floating on on clouds but what i think the the risen glorified substantial humanity of jesus does is give us a purchase into this idea that that, that eternity in, in one sense will be like this in its experience. It'll be tangible, it'll be real. It, it'll just be better. It'll just be so, so much more better, so much gloriously better. So that's what I was trying trying to do, but I was using a word that uh, uh, sort of sent alarm bells ringing for uh, this particular friend. So the question has to do with um, the nature of the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the, bo the body that Jesus has. Um, it, is there a significance in the fact that it's a human body, that's not just any sort of body, perhaps a whole new species of body, but a body that is, can, be, can be said to be a human body? What is the significance of that? Have I captured the question? Yeah. Close enough? Yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, that's a very helpful correction. That, um, again, 1 Corinthians 15 really helps us here. Um, and Paul, Paul describes the sort of nature of the continuity between the, the body that is sown and the body that is raised, you know, using kind of seed and plant imagery. So there is difference. There's, there's quite a difference between a seed and a plant, but at the same time, there's organic continuity. And, um, you know, Jesus is, is a risen human being. Uh, he takes our humanity into glory in the sense that we, we will bear his image. So just as we um, are like Adam now, we'll, we'll be like uh, him now. And, and yeah, so that the notion of continuity and discontinuity uh, is important, but it is, yeah, he is a human being. It's not, he's not just physical, substantial, loca localizable. He is, yeah, he is a human being. Um, can I step in and ask a question at, at this point, Pete, following on from that? Um, as we have discussions about particular issues in the world, and, and it comes up a lot, with, with, whether they're friends or in the broader cultural context as we discuss uh, issues about what it, how we should be living, what it really means to be human, um, what is a person, um, what is the nature of, of us as, as human beings, um, we, we do tend, when we argue as Christians and talk about these things as Christians, to refer back to our createdness. We were created to be a certain way. We can look in the world and see that God has created a certain order and so on that is still to some extent visible just by observation. Um, and yet, from what you were saying, I, I jumped down more than once in your talk, 
um, the fact that Jesus is a risen human being um, shows us the, the destiny and nature of God's purposes for humanity, for, for what humanity was always meant to be and where, where humanity is going and, and really what it means to be truly human. Do you want to say anything? Oh, that was a difficult question. But do you want to say anything about what that means for the way we speak about humanity with people? for the way we engage in ethical issues and discussing the nature of what a person is or the nature of what a good human life is, for example. Yeah. Um, well, I think that the, um, the description of, uh, that Paul gives us in Philippians 3.20 of, of waiting uh, for Jesus to return from heaven to transform our bodies to be like his body, I think that's the way in that, that you know, what, one of the, one of the sort of ethical arguments against the uniqueness of humanity is really, although they wouldn't say it in this way, but the sinfulness of humanity. You know, we, we are terrible to one another. And so, you know, you compare a serial killer to a cute, fluffy puppy, um, you know, and in one sense, the, the, the puppy just seems more, especially with kind of the Disney, Disneyfication of, of our, the way we think of animals, um, but what the what what the the resurrection glorification of Christ and our future glorification shows us, as you said, is what what humanity is meant to be, and what humanity will one day be. It shows us the destiny uh, for uh, for human beings. I, you know, I've as I've spoken, I've applied this very much to the the Christian. You know, we will be glorified. Obviously, for those who don't trust in Christ, there will still be a resurrection. John five, but it'll be a resurrection. Uh, to to judgment, but there's still a sense in which every human being um, has yeah has that eternal destiny, the the, the glorification of Jesus showing the the, the positive side of it and uh, the, the the judgment being the negative side. But um, in other words, we we can't just sort of read what humanity is like from what's happened so far and what what is the current state. We need to we need to read forward. The question has to do with um, with disability and with all the imperfections of our bodies now, but especially with people who suffer with severe imperfections now. Um, what is the the uh, the Bible's teaching about about our glorification in Christ? What hope does it give um, for the perfection of, of our imperfections? And, and what does that look like? What, what do we say when we're talking to people, and how can we help people um, think through that? Yeah, that's a very, very helpful question. Um, again, um, Romans, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, I think, really helps us. You know, what what kind of body? You know, what will our bodies be like? And uh, Paul says, uh, what you sow does not come to life until it, unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be. Um, but a bare kernel, perhaps, of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So two, two things there. The, the body that is to be, there, there is discontinuity. You know, we won't bring our imperfections into eternity. The body that is to be is not... Um, it's not going to be the same as it is sown. Again, the... the, the the seed and the plant. There's organic continuity, but the, the plant is sort of more glorious than, than the seed. And, and this is God's doing. God is able to, to transform us. So in terms of the hope, um, as much as the, the glorification of Jesus gives us the idea that we will be glorified, this rests on the power of God. And, and it's interesting, if you read 1 Corinthians 15 in the context, that, that seems to be what the Corinthians just couldn't understand. They're like, how can we be transformed? And it's because they've they've forgotten the power of God. So that that would be the beginnings of the of the things. If someone's struggling to think, you know, will I have these you know, imperfections for eternity? No. Remember the power of God. He's demonstrated in the past wonderfully in Jesus, and he, and he will do it again. Yeah, yeah. Now the question is about the tension between the warning passages, such as Hebrews 13 um, in the New Testament, which urge perseverance and warn about the dangers of, of not. Um, well, how do we clarify or understand the tension between that and the fact uh, that, as you said, Peter, Jesus is interceding for us um, before the Father, 
And so in that sense, because of the work of Christ and the work of the Spirit, our perseverance really is, is, depends on them. How do you, how do you resolve that? Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me read. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a very helpful question. Let me read Hebrews 7, uh, 25 uh, again. Uh, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And I think that there, there you have both of them there. Uh, he's able to save them to the, save, who, who is he able to save to the uttermost? Those who, uh, uh, those who draw near to God through him because he always lives to make intercession for them. So I think that in terms of our experience, it's a continued trust in Jesus. And that's what Hebrews is written to exhort us to. And in a sense, it's God's word and it, creates the faith in us. So the warning, in a sense, the, the believer will heed the warning. And the warning serves its function by causing us to continue to persevere. But, but at the base, if you like, it's not just our will and our effort. At the base is, is Jesus' intercession for us. So they're both there in, in that verse. And I think that's, yeah, that's the way that we've got to hold them together. Which is interestingly much as we'd hold together the whole Christian life. How did we become a Christian? Was it because we actually did something? Well, yes, we put our trust in Christ and repented. Was that our doing? It was. Was it completely the work of God? Yes, it was, by his spirit. And that kind of compatibilistic understanding of God working in and through his action in us, and yet us as free agents responding and acting. You see that in lots of ways, um, in many in many different strata right throughout the Bible. What does the reign of Jesus look like now? That's essentially the question. If he's reigning now, in what sense? How? Uh, he, he is reigning now. Um, I think one way into this would be that idea that picked up at the end of 2 Corinthians. You know, the Corinthians are kind of doing their own thing, even in the second letter. Um, and uh, Paul is very clear, you know, Christ is powerful among you. And the way that he's exercising his power is through the word of his apostle. So I think we see the reign of Christ uh, in, in the churches, and he rules by his word through his spirit. And, you know, we are in that age of now and not yet, and we'll see his reign um, come to its full fruition uh, when he returns. But in the meantime, we, you know, we see his reign. We, as Christians, submit to his word you know, every, every day and as we gather and we put ourselves under his word. So he's reigning uh, through his word. The question, if I can capture it, is about the degree of transformation that Jesus himself undertook. Was his resurrected, how different was his resurrected body from the body that he was born with, given that he was a special person at the very beginning, was born, uh, conceived of the Holy Spirit and so on? Uh, uh, without sin. So how, is that the essential question? How different was Jesus' resurrection body from his, the body he was born in and what implications has it had for us? Yeah, well, I guess, uh, in that case, why? Why did it need to be different? Yeah, why did it need to be different? If it was. Yeah, very, very important. You raised some really important uh, things there, Rob. Um, Jesus was without sin, absolutely. Uh, but his, uh, he was born into the line of Adam. And so, you know, we read in the Gospels, he's tired, he's asleep on the back of the boat, he's, he's hungry. Um, so he experiences what it means to, be a, to live in a fallen world. But again, he, Hebrews really helps us. So uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 2 uh, sort of says to, to achieve our redemption... Uh, Jesus had to be like us. So since therefore the children, 2.14, uh, share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things so that uh, through death he might destroy the one who has the power of uh, death. And even more strong, chapter 2, verse 17, therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Okay, later on Hebrews will qualify it without sin, but he's, he's like us in every respect. So that he goes from that transformation of a body fit for, a, fit for this fallen world to a body fit for uh, it, eternity. And that's, that's the comparison you get in 1 Corinthians 15 
uh, it's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. And sometimes people say, oh, a spiritual body, that means he's just a spirit. No, a spiritual body is a, uh, a body fit for the realm of the spirit. Okay, so Jesus had to go under, undergo a transformation and, and likewise we will. Yeah. The question is, following on from that, um, could you just tease out what it means for Jesus to be tempted in every way? Was it really in every way? How was Jesus tempted? Um, it's an excellent and important question, um, and I, it's sort of getting to the edges of my, um, <laughs> my my knowledge. I'm sort of I'm looking to my my friend my friend and uh, doctor and colleague at the back. Um, th th this is a, a a bit of a debate in terms of the incarnation and to what degree did Jesus share our fallen humanity um, and there are different um, there are different um, interpretations but I think you know we, we got to read the, the the temptation accounts in, in the Gospels that, that you know he, he is tempted I don't know I don't know how much how far we can go with psychologically what Jesus was experiencing but the text says that he was tempted so that the temptation was there what what that met uh, inside I mean I guess the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane you, you see that psychological anguish there is the temptation to give you know to give this away and yet he's resisted and I think in a sense his never giving into temptation actually means that he experienced the full force of temptation. We, we don't feel the full force of temptation because we give into it. But he was tempted and never gave into temptation. So experienced the, the full force of it. That'll be the that'll be the beginning of the of, of the answer. Thank you for, for straying onto the um, onto the turf of dogmatic theology and helping us out there. Peter that's that's fantastic. Um, I think our time is, is just about gone. Um, it, it's been, it is gone in fact. It's, it's excellent that, um, that Peter has, has, in a sense, cast our mind, our gaze upwards and forwards, as he says, uh, as he said several times tonight, to, to who Jesus is now, to his glorified resurrected body, to his eternal rule, to his intercession, um, to the way he has taken humanity with him uh, into the Godhead, to sit at God's right hand, as the truly human person who reigns over all. And it's fascinating as you read the New Testament how many of the ethical appeals of the New Testament look forward and upwards to Jesus and to the next, the new creation and to who Christ is for the power of their ethical appeal. Um, particularly in Colossians 3, where the whole basis of living a changed life, of regarding certain things as evil and earthly and to be dispensed with, uh, and other things as, as worthy and good and belonging to the to, to what we should be like as renewed people, is on the basis that Christ is risen and that our life belongs upwards and forwards with him, with the resurrected human, truly human Christ. Um, and Christian ethics in very large measure is about grasping where humanity is going and the purpose of everything and living in light of that now. That, that's the shape of Christian ethics. It's, it's why it's so different from other ethics, which are about doing certain things now in order perhaps to participate in the future uh, in that kind of uh, lo moral logic. Um, but for Christianity, um, our ethical basis is that the true humanity and resurrection of Jesus shows that God has a purpose for this whole creation and the purpose is Jesus Christ. That's what it looks like. That's what our rule looks like. That's what humanity looks like. And so as we approach pretty much everything we do uh, in our daily lives as Christians and every issue we face, we need to keep referring it upwards and forwards, as, as Peter's been encouraging us tonight, and to think about what does true humanity look like in Christ, and therefore what does our life look like now as we live for Christ. Uh, it's very much the shape of the New Testament ethic, and, and so it's been a, an enormous encouragement tonight to have that so clarified and forced home to us uh, in such a powerful and clear way. Thank you so much, Peter, for doing that. Um, it set thoughts off all, all through my mind, all through your talk. Uh, and has for many of us as well.